During 1994, 650 farmers and local people had extensive input into the development of a land and water care strategy for Western Australia's South Coast region. Three main trends emerged from these consultations. Firstly, small catchment groups of 6 to 15 farmers were becoming more important for planning and agency input than the bigger groups, such as land conservation districts. Secondly, it was clear that a number of farmers were not implementing works because they were unsure whether they were technically or economically sound, or whether they would achieve their aims. Thirdly, there were also a number of coordinators, technical and economic people providing uncoordinated advice. The Small Catchment Support Teams project was developed as part of the first South Coast initiative for Natural Heritage Trust funding to address these issues. It was hoped to achieve the following aims through the project. Establish four teams of land care professionals, based at Albany, Ravensthorpe, Esperance and Catanning, to provide best management advice to 54 catchment groups over three years, about 50% of the South Coast farmers. Coordinate the delivery of external funds to groups to ensure that they are used in an efficient and technically and economically sound manner, and integrate catchment, farm and business planning with group training and with pest and weed control strategies. With funding assistance from the Natural Heritage Trust, the Small Catchment Support Teams project commenced in 1997 and was concluded in 2000. It brought together existing professional and technical officers to provide focused advice to catchment groups across the western south coast. The south coast region of Western Australia includes the catchments of all the southerly flowing rivers between the Franklin Gordon in the west and Cape Arid in the east. This particular project focused its activities in the western portion of the region, including the Kent Franklin, the Palin Up North Stirlings, the Albany Hinterland and the Fitzgerald Biosphere sub-regions. The project complemented similar work underway in the eastern areas of the Esperance Sand Plain and the Mallee sub-regions. Most of the South Coast region has been developed in the past 60 years and relies heavily on agriculture for income. The region experiences mild temperatures and has the longest growing season in WA, resulting in high potential yields for existing main industries and the capability to diversify further in horticulture, viticulture, aquaculture and silviculture. Farmers on the south coast are known for their ability to adjust quickly to changing market prices and environmental pressures. The south coast region contains one third of the state's native plant species and the Fitzgerald biosphere alone contains more than 2,200 vascular plants, more plants than the whole of the Murray-Darling Basin. The region contains one-third of the threatened flora and fauna in WA. The South Coast is an extremely fragile environment. Dry land salinity is likely to degrade up to one million hectares unless farming systems which use more water can be developed within the next two decades. The sandy nature of South Coast soils makes them liable to erosion, acidification, compaction and water repellents. Almost all the rivers in their catchments in the south coast region discharge into estuaries, which are closed by sandbars or into wetlands that are rarely flushed. Having a system that is effectively closed limits drainage engineering options in some catchments. To better understand the impact of the small catchment support teams project in addressing land care issues on the ground, we would like to present comments made by project participants. Kent Franklin the Kent Franklin subregion covers more than 467,000 hectares of WA's south coast, from the community of Broomhill in the north to Walpole in the south, and including the towns of Tanbelup, Cranbrook and Franklin. Within the Kent Franklin, the farm enterprises vary from west to east according to rainfall. Cereal cropping and sheep farming are the largest enterprises, with predominantly wheat sheep farms. However, more recently, other enterprises have emerged such as farm forestry, plantings of blue gums, pines and sandalwood, aquaculture using rainbow trout, viticulture in the Franklin River region and intensive horticulture with olives and raspberries. The Kent Franklin Catchment Support Officer commenced in 1998 as a local Department of Agriculture point of contact for the community. Kelly Hill, the current Catchment Support Officer, is based in the Gillamai Community Agricultural Centre in Cranbrook. Kelly's main role in the project was to coordinate planning and implementation of activities involving farmers and the catchment support team professionals. 
the catchment support officer position worked closely with the Gillamai Community Land Care Motivator, Pip Crook, also based at the Gillamai Centre. Pip and Kelly worked together with community and catchment groups. They also coordinated local communications, newsletters and the Cranbrook Shire activities. Initially, the activities I was involved in with Kelly Hill as the catchment support officer were as an onlooker and uh, participant in focus catchment groups as they went through their um, activities. And then I was involved with those groups as they went through their implementation stage, so as they worked through getting their works on ground. Other activities that um, I've participated in have been the land care, uh, Leadership in Land Care Awards, um, communications uh, with landholders, uh, also um, feeding data through to Kelly on um, individual farmers, cadastral information, contact details and all those sorts of bits and pieces that I pick up as a uh, community support officer. The support offered has been helpful in that there's another person around the office who also has local knowledge which helped immensely when I first started my position. The Two positions working side by side sometimes created some confusion with landholders as to who did what and, and uh, the overlapping that sometimes happens with those roles. But communication with landholders effectively nullified that situation. It was also very good to have a locally based person in the position so that uh, landholders felt that they had someone immediately accessible and they didn't have to contact Albany or Katanning to have access to that person and it also made it very easy in an office situation for me to have someone right there that I could access for my own needs. The focus catchment process was a method used by the Department of Agriculture to work with community groups to develop catchment plans which was coordinated by the catchment support officer. The process involved intensive catchment scale planning with particular emphasis on surface water management, identification of land management units and best practice management options. The focus catchment process brought together the relevant experts from within the Department of Agriculture along with those external to the department such as members of the Water and Rivers Commission and Bush Care to work as a team. Kayleen Parker, a river care officer with the Water and Rivers Commission, is one person who participated in the focus catchment process. Well, through Kelly Hill, the catchment support officer and the catchment support team, Water and Rivers have been involved in monitoring the condition of some of the waterways in the catchment. Uh, we monitor the, the major tributaries um, and also the river itself. We also have done foreshore surveys of, of a couple of the tributaries, including the Slab Hut and the Gordon River and the river itself. And we've kind of worked with the focus catchment team to put this into a catchment planning kind of framework. The, the catchment support project and, and the offices that are involved are, are an important component of, of a way where we can work with farmers and catchment groups in a more strategic and kind of targeted approach. The catchment pro, uh, focus process has taught me a lot about how um, agencies and community groups and landholders can all work together to tackle some of the bigger problems that we have. Uh, in the future, I, I know that any work I do will be conducted in the, using the same process. What I'll actually be doing with um, the, the process and some of the, the learnings that we've had out of the catchment support process and the, the way it worked, so I'll be taking this model to Perth and we'll be looking at trying to um, use this model on a statewide framework so that we can look at protecting our waterways in a, uh, in a catchment framework but using the model the catchment support team developed down here in the South Coast region. Will Carrington-Jones is a landholder who has worked with the catchment support officer and participated along with the rest of the Upper Slab Hut group in the focus catchment process. Uh, 1996 we first started with the Slab Hut, Upper Slab Hut catchment group Kelly Hogan, as she was then, came to us in 1998 and as our coordinator um, and we have been involved with activities pretty well since then which revolved around remnant bushwork, revolved around uh, catchment, creek catchment regeneration and through to planting perennials, particularly with lucerne. I think one of the most important aspects of Kelly's work with us has been the support she has given us and kept us motivated in our catchment group. Um, our catchment group is probably very typical of a lot of the focus groups. 
had Kelly, when Kelly came along, had she not been able to keep our interest in it, we would have died in the arse as a group. Um, it was probably one of the biggest assets that we have having uh, someone like that involved with the group. John Sprigg is also a landholder, as well as the chairperson of the Franklin Gordon Catchment Management Group, an umbrella organisation for all the catchments in the sub-region. The running of the Franklin Gordon Catchment Management Group since Kelly started some three years ago, um, she's been involved with coordinating the, the whole process of uh, running, the, running the catchment management group. The selection process whereby we chose the focus catchment groups uh, in two waves, community uh, selection process where the community actually self-assessed. Particularly during the focus catchment process, I felt that we, go, we made great ground. We had uh, a, approximately a 60% participation from our catchment members. It's quite a large catchment. And uh, that 60% was quite consistent. Um, some, some highlights were the, the fact that uh, the things that we, we focused on like development of uh, perennials in the landscape, um, soil pits to just show people what's actually happening that is in turn causing the problems that everybody is participating. Not only the 60% that participated, but the 40% that didn't have the same problems. And the one regret is that the 40% who were canvassed quite consistently and cheerfully on my, uh, to my mind by myself uh, were unwilling to look to see to find out. They will eventually, but it will not be through the efforts of a focus catchment. It will be the ripple effect of a uh, community uh, that, that um, gradually assimilates some of the information available. Uh, digital elevation modelling, along with the, the maps that we were supplied with as part of the focus catchment process, allowed, it, allowed some really great work to be done in surface drainage. And uh, it, it was a, a bit of a shame that we couldn't take that a little bit further into the strategic planning, plantings of perennials in the landscape, given we had such good information uh, from, from uh, dollar, etc., on, on our landscape. It has reinforced the need to move on the water we cannot use. The technical information that has been provided to us in the form of um, our, some excellent speakers on, on um, high water use perennial systems, both legumes and grasses, has reinforced and probably made us work a little bit more concentratedly on uh, surface drainage and the perennial side of things. The whole catchment, now we've gone so far, needs more hydrological definition of problems. Uh, at a recent field day just two days ago, uh, we actually came to the conclusion that mapping of the whole Franklin Gordon catchment could be taken and uh, best bet options in some confined local aquifers could solve uh, almost immediately in, in several years a lot of those apparent and uh, emerging uh, land care problems with rising water tables. Palling up North Stirling. The Palling up North Stirling lies to the east of the Kent Franklin sub-region. It covers nearly 487,000 hectares and its southern boundary is the magnificent Stirling Range National Park. The Palling up North Stirling is made up of the gently undulating Palling up River Valley and the very flat, internally drained North Stirling Basin. Annual rainfall varies from 360 to 500 millimetres. The small communities of Noangarup, Borden and Ongarup are contained within the Palling up North Stirling and are supported by the agricultural industry. 
farming enterprises are predominantly a varying mix of livestock and cropping. Income in the region is largely derived from cereal, canola and legume crops, as well as wool and meat. The area has a reputation for consistently producing record cereal crops in WA. Cindy Stevens is the catchment support officer based in the Nawangarup Community Agricultural Centre. Her role is similar to that of Kelly's in the Kent Franklin, to effectively coordinate the activities of the catchment support team to deliver on a local level the needs of farmers in focus catchment groups. Ray Squibb is a farmer and the Anderson Lake Catchment Group's leader. The Anderson Lake Catchment discharges into the A-class Anderson Lake Nature Reserve, which harbours the endangered Western Mouse. The reserve is also a significant cultural site for local Noongar people. One good thing was that we could go to our catchment support officer to get in touch with the catchment support team, um, the hydrologist and the revegetation officers. It was just great to be able to go direct to, to someone to um, find all the, all the uh, relevant people. The catchment support idea was, was very good. It was a good concept, but in the Anderson Lake and the Camel Lake catchment groups, we had such a diverse range of problems that we probably tend to spread ourselves too thinly. We uh, perhaps should have concentrated on a few more key issues, such as drainage and revegetation and um, pasture production, perhaps, whereas we tended to go off in every direction and tried to solve the lot and perhaps didn't achieve what we set out to, to achieve. David Hancock is a local farmer. He's also the chairman of the Noangarup Land Conservation District Committee, as well as the leader of the Mabinup Mataquin Catchment Group. In these multiple roles, David was a key local community contact for Cindy. Catchment support officer and team was a good concept. I fear you get a lot more done when you got a team involved rather than individually. You can focus on a catchment. Yep. Due to a report that was done, as in the Farmers First and the Pallon up north Stirling, which was instrumented by a catchment officer, Paul and Noangar up LCD, the, we're heading in a new direction and lots of new ideas. Having a local community support officer has been a great benefit to the Narangup LCDC and the local farmers. So I think this is essential to keep this in the future. Due to the poor seasons and the economical climate in the last few years, the farmers in this region haven't used the support team as much as I would have liked. Steve Newby is a farmer and a part-time community land care coordinator for the Narangup Shire. Like David, Steve has been involved with the catchment support officer on a number of levels, but in particular from a professional level. I think we had a, um, a great catchment support team and particularly a catchment support officer. Um, I, I think that um, the direction was lacking a bit. Um, the um, catchment support team knew what they wanted to achieve, but the um, farmers didn't know what they wanted to achieve out of the process. Ortho photos were one of the good things that came out of the, the process. Uh, certainly the hydrological advice that we got um, was good. Uh, the, uh, the project, the process actually led on to a, a couple of other projects and involvement in that of the catchment support team being the Two Rivers Lucin project with the sighting of um, bosometers and the Sandalwood project um, from the Revegetation expert. What I've learned is that, that you have to look at salinity and every possible solution uh, to control salinity or to to um, to reduce salinity. Um, there is a number of options, and and every option needs to be looked at. The Mills Lake catchment was one of the first focus catchments to complete the entire focus catchment process in the Palin up North Stirling. They also received NHT funds to protect the wetlands of the catchment. The following comments were made by a farmer in the Mills Lake catchment. The Mills Lake catchment was the first focus catchment to complete the process in this region. Um, they also received NHT funds to protect the wetlands in this catchment. The concept was good. With the focus catchment group, there was an impetus to meet and deal with major problems. There is no doubt that personal contact with the catchment support officer oiled the wheels to get things done on the ground. Because really that's where it's got to happen, on the ground. The last two years have really been so extremely difficult. We've had a drought and a locust plague and it's taken the focus off land care. Though in some ways it really has emphasised 
the need for land care. Hydrology. Alan Seymour was appointed as a hydrologist for the Department of Agriculture and based in Katanning. Alan provided a key hydrology role to specifically complement the catchment support teams working in the Palinup North Stirling and Kent Franklin. Through listening and talking to farmers about the challenges of tackling salinity in their properties, Alan was able to integrate his academic knowledge with practical on-the-ground considerations to provide professional advice for catchment plans and their implementation. As part of the Small Catchment Support Team's project, trials using low-cost groundwater siphons to reduce dryland salinity have shown promising results. The trials have also highlighted several other related issues needing investigation, such as downstream impacts of the discharge water, as well as opportunities for productive use of the water. Justin Taylor is the leader of the Gordon River Catchment Group. His farm is one of several where Alan is trialling groundwater siphons. Justin is a strong advocate of thorough investigations into all the options for combating dry land salinity where groundwater siphoning may be one of the many strategies implemented on farm. Our uh, catchment group, the Gordon River Catchment Group, we've been involved with Alan Seymour principally with two uh, projects, the State Salinity Council 00S051, Engineering Tools for Managing Salinity 2, Siphon Assisted Relief Wells, and we also have a National Heritage Trust funded uh, project as well, 003113. The uh, Gordon River Focus Catchment Rehabilitation and Revegetation 2000 and Beyond. I think we've received um, excellent re uh, support from Alan, uh, principally for both projects. Uh, when our group first started, we, we identified the need for hydro hydrological expertise, nothing of which was available within the group, and we were very fortunate that um, someone in Alan's position did come along and was we were able to use his expertise. So we've been very appreciative of what he has had to offer. I think it's very hard to say just what it would be that we would do differently because principally the work that we've been involved in has been um, almost groundbreaking in itself in the nature of the work, particularly with the, the groundwater siphons and the relief wells. So it's very hard to know or to be able to say how we would do it any differently. But otherwise it's just, um, yeah, we just have to be patient and we just uh, keep on going. Siphoned groundwater or low saline can be used as sheep drinking water. Dave and Katie Temby have successfully harvested rainbow trout from trial dams on their farm fed with siphoned groundwater. We've been working with Alan, the hydrologist, um, on monitoring the groundwater in, on my place here. For years we've just sort of sat here and watched the water run down the creek and sort of thought, well, we should do something with that. But Alan's came up with a couple of suggestions and um, really sort of motivated us into the fact of doing something with, with, with fish. Albany Hinterland. The Albany Hinterland extends from just west of Denmark to the Palinup River in the east. Rainfall varies from 1100 millimetres in the southwest to as little as 400 millimetres in the northeast. As a result, land uses vary enormously. The west is dominated by forest, with large areas of farm forestry, grazing, vineyards, some dairies and smaller areas of intensive horticulture. Moving east, cropping with varying mixes of livestock grazing becomes the main enterprise. The Albany hinterland can be divided into three catchment systems. From west to east there is the Wilson Inlet catchment, discharging at Denmark. Then the Oyster Harbour catchment, discharging at Albany. And finally, the eastern hinterland, which comprises a number of river systems which mostly discharge into lakes and wetlands. Degradation issues vary enormously, with nutrient enrichments of waterways, waterlogging and water erosion dominating in the west. In the east, salinity, non-wetting sands, wind erosion and soil acidity affect large areas. Jean and Harley Webb are farmers in the upper reaches of the Wilson Inlet who have a passionate commitment to land care on their farm. Jean is active at varying levels in the wider community, providing leadership in catchment management across all community and government levels. Bruce Raddus was our original catchment support officer. He gave us a lot of uh, on the ground, one to one support and a lot of practical advice. The catchment support officer was covering a considerable area and this did restrict what could be achieved. The main impact has been the, uh, our general awareness of the biodiversity in our catchment and the sustainability issues. 
Um, I believe that the viability of our farm has improved since going through this process. The focus catchment process has not changed some farmers' attitudes to clearing and drainage. I believe that we're going to have to have stronger enforcement of uh, legislation for this to happen. The process put considerable pressure on the uh, coordinator uh, in time and effort. I've spent most of my farming life knocking all the trees down and clearing. In the last three years, I've spent all my time trying to stand them back up again. Michael Easton farms in the South Stirling catchment, which lies in Albany's East Hinterland area. Michael has a long history in natural resource management. Early in the group's development, we had a number of activities based on a list of priorities identified by the group. From these activities and workshops, we lodged a successful application to NHT for funding. The workshops and activities were targeted to the group and their particular needs, and things were rolling quite smoothly in towards the end of uh, our second catchment support officer's uh, role. Two of the biggest changes I've noticed in the district in the recent times from our group's development is the amount of no-till cropping and the claying of non-wetting soils. Most of the group members are now aware of the remnant of vegetation and the role it plays and are fencing out with an NHT funding. NHT funding is also being used to revegetate degraded remnant vegetation areas. Michael Power is a farm forestry advisor employed by the Department of Conservation and Land Management and is based in Albany. Throughout the Albany hinterland, farm forestry has huge potential as an option for managing land degradation and increasing farm profits. As a consequence, Michael has been a major contributor to the catchment support team. The catchment support officers have been an excellent conduit between farmers and catchment groups and specialists and technical support people like myself. They've helped me be more focused and effective by providing me with uh, access to a group of farmers who have been primed to work with agencies um, in natural resource management. Working with catchment support officers has been tremendous. It's allowed a farm forestry specialist like myself to be involved in the planning process, but also to follow that through to implementation, uh, whereby the National Heritage Trust has assisted farmers to implement their plans. The partnerships that have been formed through this process between state agencies such as the Department of Agriculture, Water and Rivers Commission and the Department of Conservation and Land Management and with uh, our regional groups such as uh, the South Coast Regional Initiative Planning Team, uh, other groups such as Timber 2002 and then with our catchment groups and farmers have been very fruitful, uh, exciting and uh, very beneficial. Fitzgerald Biosphere the Fitzgerald Biosphere subregion covers more than 1.35 million hectares on Western Australia's south coast. The region is home to the world-renowned Fitzgerald National Park and the associated Fitzgerald Biosphere, part of the UNESCO-initiated Man and Biosphere program. Agricultural interests in the region traditionally vary from grazing sheep and cattle and small-scale cropping in the higher rainfall areas close to the coast through to large cereal, oilseed and legume cropping areas to the north. There have been many more recent developments in farm forestry, aquaculture, perennial pastures and summer crops. The Fitzgerald Biosphere Catchment Support Officer is Rick Farrell, based at the Ravensthorpe Community Agricultural Centre in Ravensthorpe. Rick works closely with Jenny Chambers, the Community Land Care Coordinator in Ravensthorpe. The Catchment Support Officer has been effective in providing information and services to the individual farmers and land care groups in the community. He's been a valuable technical resource for people to get information from and has been involved in providing land care information to the local schools. The Catchment Support Officer lives and works in the community. He's fairly well known around here which I guess is quite important because people feel a lot more comfortable discussing things with someone that they know and can relate to. The district varies considerably in the farming practices from one part of the Shire to another and it's good to have someone that can relate to the farmers and know what works in one catchment and what doesn't work in the other catchments. Even after a run of difficult seasons, people's attitudes towards land care and sustainable farming practices are still very positive. There's a lot of on-ground work still going on at the moment. I think the role of the catchment support officer has greatly assisted in this, but we've still got a long way to go. 
Madeline Norman is a landholder and member of the Mollyall Wooden Up Catchment Group, who have worked with the catchment support officer to develop a catchment plan and implemented on-ground land care works on farms throughout the catchment. There's a lot of information around for, for various land care work and sometimes you feel a bit swamped with it all coming in and not all of it is relevant for our area or our catchment. So the catchment support officer helps sift out what is relevant for us and to find more if we need it and also to apply it. Now people in the catchment are concentrating on revegetation in problem areas and also surface water management and again there's a lot of work we wouldn't be doing if the catchment support officer wasn't providing all the information and yeah just generally supporting us with funding applications which aren't always easy to complete. He also finds out what type of grants are available and where they could be used best and generally perhaps has put them together. There are newer groups now also starting up and they still need a lot of guidance for which the catchment support officer is very helpful. Another landholder who has worked with the catchment support officer and is the coordinator of the Yellow Bup Creek catchment group, Greg Clark, has been actively involved in land care for many years. A few years ago, the Yellow Bup Creek catchment group uh, developed a catchment plan to identify areas in the catchment that needed rehabilitation. As a result of the catchment plan, the group is um, trying to fence off the major creek system within the catchment and also uh, revegetating degraded areas in the catchment and fencing off remnants of bush within the catchment. The support officers uh, come out and help us um, finalise where we're going to establish trees um, to identify you know, what types of trees are probably best suited to the sites. Uh, the, the local catchment support officer has been very helpful in getting projects up and going and um, giving us technical information and support so that we can follow those projects through. We found that a local on the ground approach worked really well for us. Land mapping. A groundbreaking component of the small catchment support team's project was the inclusion of funding for a pilot study to develop two innovative mapping tools for salt prediction and vegetation change. These were developed using Landsat image processing and terrain modelling. The catchment planning process provided an ideal opportunity for ground truthing of this data. Here's an example of the three-dimensional landscape image produced. It shows the Peter Valley Focus catchment in the Kent Franklin subregion. This simulation image is produced using the improved elevation data or digital terrain model. It indicates simulated change over time as the water table rises and reaches equilibrium with the above ground flow level. The blue color shows areas of the catchment that this method has categorized as being consistently of low production and at risk. This is not, however, a salinity prediction for the catchment, but an illustration of the unrestricted water table rise if no intervention was to take place. This work helped develop the method used in the Land Monitor Project, which mapped salinity and vegetation change throughout the southwest of Western Australia, involving over 16 million hectares of land. In conclusion, a look at the Palling Up North Stirling area illustrates the extent of the planning process and the evolution of the project over its three-year life. The green areas are the focus catchments for which planning started in the first year of the project. The pink areas are the new focus catchments that started in the second year. And the blue areas are the focus catchments started in the third and final year. Overall, the Small Catchment Support Team's project coordinated planning for over 676,256 hectares, or 18.5% of this part of the region. Complementary work was also carried out in the Esperance area, bringing the on-ground works to a total of 922,324 hectares. This table shows a breakdown of on-ground works resulting from this planning, including kilometres of fencing, 
hectares of remnant vegetation protected, hectares of revegetation, kilometres of earthworks, and hectares of perennial pastures. Ross Williams, Gardner River farmer and chairperson of the Regional Assessment Panel, reflects on the Small Catchment Support Team's project. I've been involved in this project since 1996 when it was first submitted to NHT for funding and this uh, project has been run in conjunction with a similar project in Esperance area just because of the size of our sub-region we've had two simultaneous projects running. There have been many important learning experiences for both professional people and community groups and the groups in themselves have became quite competitive in their approach to the planning process because they could see the advantage and benefits in, in getting support for on-ground work and professional advice. Above all, this project supported a strategic approach to information collection and delivery, both to the farmers and catchment groups in the way that they approached this situation to improve their productivity. This was achieved using teams of professional staff working collaboratively with farmers in priority catchment areas. This process has helped ensure that all government and community funding spent on implementation is well targeted and into priority areas to achieve a maximum benefit. This project highlights several challenges for the future. Planning is an ongoing process and there is a need for ongoing consistent support well beyond a three year period, especially with the highly variable seasons and economics that typify farming in WA. The level of experience of professional staff is vital for speedy acceptance and information transfer to landholders. The process is reliant on and demanding of committed and active farm leaders and focused catchments that concentrate on a single priority issue at a time were more satisfied. Finally, the emphasis on planning needs to be better balanced with changing management practices.